Hello, this is Invector and welcome to my newest How to Fire 4 video. In today's video, I'm going to teach new players who come to Hearts of Fire 4 who want to learn the game and how to play the game. So this is a disclaimer, this is for single player only and this is for newest players uh, which can be described as 0 to 100 hours in the game. So uh, we hit single player and new game, 1936, because no one really plays 1939. And we pick our nation from this list or from select country. We can actually put, we can actually select any country. Uh, I'm going to take Iron Man mode off because when this is off, uh, I can actually use the console commands to show you guys uh, how some things work. Uh, and the difference between uh, turning historical AI focuses on and off is that when historical AI focuses is on you know what's going to happen in the game regardless of basically what you do in the game because like if historical ai focuses is on then germany will uh, go the normal their historical path they will uh, annex austria then take czechoslovakia puppet slovakia and then they will attack poland in 1939 then attack netherlands belgium france and basically be in the world war ii with uh, united kingdom and they will also attack uh, the Soviets in 1941. Uh, also, uh, Japan will attack China in 1937. And they will also attack uh, Philippines in 1941. And United States will join that war because uh, Philippines is actually a puppet of United States. So United States will join the Allies in 1941 and the world will be at war. So if you turn historical AI focuses off, then anything and everything that can happen in the game, that will, that will be a lot of civil wars, uh, a lot of different factions. Italy will switch factions all over the place. Uh, Turkey might go uh, the Ottoman Empire. Uh, Poland can go the King Route. Like everything can happen in the non-historical AI focuses. So if you want to play in a World War II simulation game, then you need historical AI focuses on. So I'm going to be leaving this on, but it doesn't really matter because I'm just going to show you the mechanics of the game. But we are going to take the Iron Man mod off. Uh, and with Iron Man mod on, basically what you do is uh, you can get uh, the challenges and achievements in the game with Iron Man mod on. And with off, you can't, uh, but you can use the console commands uh, when you actually do this. So we are going to start now. now we started as Philippines, it doesn't really matter because we can just tag Jur and we are playing as Germany now. So uh, I'm picking Germany because it's uh, the easiest country to play. And by easiest I mean it's the most straightforward uh, country to play. Because you have a lot of countries that you can actually conquer and the, uh, the national focus is actually very straightforward to um, understand and continue with. Uh, I'm not going to be looking at the German focus tree or any kind of focus tree because those are learning how to play as one country and I will actually I would actually need to uh, do this for every single country because every single country has a different uh, national focus tree unless you are playing with a country that has the generic focus tree which is the which is this one like Albania or Austria but uh, with like most of the other nations uh, that were uh, somewhat in the World War II, like let's just say Turkey, you don't have the generic focus tree, uh, like Poland and uh, the Soviet Union, it doesn't matter. Like if, if you want to play as one of those countries, then in addition to the general things about the game, you actually need to learn their uh, events and, and their decisions and also their focus tree and the leaders and the political leaders and whatever. So apart from all that, I'm just going to be teaching you about uh, the game and how how the game basically works. Uh, when you click on your flag, you will open up this political uh, side. There's your leader. When you hover over your leader, you can see what kind of bonuses you get from your leader. Uh, we have the national spirits. You can hover over these and learn about uh, what your national spirits are. Uh, most countries start with uh, negative uh, national spirits and there are some things in the national focus tree that help you remove or reduce the negative bonuses you get from your national spirits. And there are also things that give uh, new national sp uh, spirits for almost every nation in the, uh, in the game. 
So national spirits are really important. This is what makes a country basically, because uh, if a country doesn't really have a national focus tree, uh, but has the basic one, then you don't really get a lot of national spirits and it's just a, a basic country to play with. Uh, we have no elections, of course, we are the brown ideology, and this is the percentage of ideologies in our country. And when this uh, shifts, let's just say we have uh, 50 plus percent of uh, democratic support or any kind, uh, then we can have a civil war or th th there could be a, uh, like a national uh, referendum or some sorts. So it's better to keep this up uh, for whatever uh, alignment you have on. and. The more support you have for your party, the more stability you get from it. So I'm gonna uh, mention stability later on. But uh, basically, the but the more uh, color you have on your country, the best. So try to get this to 100% uh, for almost all of the countries in whichever um, faction you have on. Occupied territories shows you the occupied land that you have. Uh, you can click this show non-resisting countries because if they are not resisting, like Kashubia, we have this place uh, and they have the foreign claim, but uh, we have this court, so they are not resisting. So you can just click this off and we don't really have any uh, resistance in our captured lands. But after you capture some lands, there will be uh, lands listed here and you can view their uh, foreign supports and uh, resistances and compliance and so on. I will show you this show you this a little later. Uh, with collaborations, if you uh, actually let let's uh, mention this when we get to the spy section. Uh, many subject is when you have a subject. So if you if we tag ing, we have United Kingdom, and there you go. We have six puppets. And when you hover over these, it's a dominion. What does dominion mean? It tells you what it means. And there's the um, the slider for this country to either become free or become a colony. So you need to push this to the left and they will try to push this to the right to get free from you. And you will try to make them into a colony and maybe then annex them and uh, add their lands to your country. So this is the management uh, place for the colonies. Let's switch back to Germany. Uh, with laws and government, so what the, what do these do? So this is the conscription one, this the conscription law. What this means is how many how, how much percentage of your population is being recruited to become soldiers? And by soldiers, I mean land force, air force, and naval force. You can use these men for ships. When you are deploying ships, uh, you need manpower. Uh, when you click on any of the ships, uh, it will actually show you uh, how many manpower they need. Uh, let me just find it. There we go, manpower 200. So if you make a submarine, you're going to be spending 200 manpower from your man manpower pool. So uh, this... Uh, calculates how many people you will elect from your population to become soldiers and uh, the move when you're moving up you get debuffs to your country but more men in your manpower pool so if you move up to service by requirement uh, you get minus 10 percent construction speed minus 10 percent factories output etc because you are basically pulling men from men uh, from factories and adding them, in, adding them into your uh, land forces. So the more you move up, uh, the less effective your factories and your construction and your dockyards become, but the more men you get to actually put on the map and use them as soldiers. Uh, so what you should be going for here is extensive conscription. There are ways to get more manpower by like other, other places, but uh, if you can't actually do any of those, then it's okay to go to service by requirement or anything above. Or if you actually have a lot of factories, then you can actually move up and get more men. But what I suggest is extensive conscription for every country. So this is the trade law. So let's just look at limited exports. So what this gives is a little bit of bonus to construction, research, factory output, dockyard output, but this also gives 
25% of your resources to the market. And when you look at closed economy, it gives no resources to the market, but you get no benefits uh, that you got from limited exports. And if you go free trade, you get a lot of bonuses to construction speed, research, and factory output and dockyard output, but you get your 80% of your resources to the market. So in this, what you should do. So if you're not at war and you don't have a lot of resources, free trade is by far the best thing you can do for your country, most likely. But if you're at war and no one can actually buy your resources, and I'll get to trading uh, later on when, you get, when we get to trade. Uh, so when you're at war or when you need a lot of resources and you have a lot of resources in your country, then it's better to go to limited exports or closed economy. Uh, and that, that's the more efficient thing to do because you actually need those resources then. Uh, this is the economy law. So what this does is, uh, let's just hover over uh, civilian economy. So this gives 35% of your factories to consumer goods, which is basically wasted. And you get a lot of uh, negative modifiers on uh, military factory construction speed and civilian factory construction speed. This is a net negative for any nation. And as you move up to war economy, you get removed from those all those nasty modifiers to your construction speed and you uh, get the uh, factories put on your consumer goods removed like this is 35 this is 30 25 and 20 so with this you're actually just wasting 20 percent of your factories on consumer goods and you also get a bonus to your military factory construction speed and that's 20 percent uh, total mobilization is a bit too far because it also reduces your recruitable population by 3% and that's just a 3% reduction. So if you have uh, extensive conscript uh, conscription, that's 5% and if you have total mobilization, you have minus 3%. So that just gives you 2% of your population as uh, manpower. But this also gives you 10% uh, more military factory uh, construction speed. Also reduces the consumer goods by another 10%. So this is a big buff if you can actually take the hit from the recruitable population debuff. Now we can move up to total mobilization and when we do that, we actually get something here that's called women in the workforce. It gives 3% back to your recruitable population but removes 5% of your stability. So uh, after you get your total mobilization, you can just uh, do this and you get no hit to your recruitable popula uh, population but know that when you're at peace you will stay at total mobilization but this decision will be removed from your country so you will get uh, the negative three percent recruitable population uh, from total mobilization so uh, i don't really recommend this for newcomers i just recommend the war economy so just go up to war economy. So for the political advisors, there are a lot of advisors for different countries. And the good ones are the ones that give political power gain. So that's 15% because political power is really good. And the more of the more political power you have, the better your country becomes basically. Uh, if you have uh, conquered a lot of land, then Prince of Terror is actually really good. Uh, because this gives non-core manpower, so we usually have our manpower from our cores and this gives 2% non-core manpower So the more land you have that is conquered the mo more manpower you will get from this uh, You get foreign subversive activities efficiency. This is something else entirely. I will not get into this and damage to garrisons because the conquered lands need to have garrisons and damage to garrisons reduced is actually very good for your country and uh, like there, there are a lot of uh, good uh, advisors from this, like this. This gives war support and uh, brown ideology support, which is good for our country. Uh, this gives uh, production cost minus 2.5%. It's not a lot, but it's something. Also gives political power gain. This gives military factory construction speed 10%, which is good. Uh, there are good things here. So try to fill all three positions with uh, good uh, advisors, uh, but it will be different for uh, almost every country. 
So just read them and uh, try to assess which one is the best. Also, uh, when you are playing, uh, let's switch to tag Bell. So we are Belgium and we have the, the, the basic focus tree. So what we have here is the democratic reformer, which gives uh, 0.1 democracy support. And also the same thing for the other three ideologies, so other, other two ideologies. So you need to hire these uh, people to, let's say you hire this guy and you want to switch your ideology. So when you do that, uh, this, uh, this, this thing opens up and you can open up your country to political discourse. And after you pass 50% of this guy's support in your country, you can peacefully switch to that ideology or you can just initiate a civil war and forcibly uh, switch your ideology to ideology supporting guy that you have hired. You can also unhire these people, by the way, when, when you click the same guy, it asks you if you're if you want to remove them and if you say okay then it gets removed these four are the uh, new addition in the last expansion that we had so the first one is for tanks so this is the infantry tank designer medium tank designer this is different for all of the countries by the way and they all give different bonuses because like infantry tank designer is not the same with medium tank designer and if you switch to let's just say tag jur you're gonna have four of them. You have Porsche, Heavy Tank Designer, and Fast Tank Designer, and Medium Tank, and stand Standard Design Production. So this gives something else, this gives something else. So you will actually need to read these up on whatever nation you're on, and you need to check them to see what kind of bonuses you will get if you start using them. And how you use them is, when you're researching something, let's just say you're gonna research some tanks, uh, the game actually asks you what kind of designer you want these to be on. And you can actually select this and it will start spending your political power on that designer and then they can actually earn XP and get your bonuses from them. And when you're putting up uh, production, let's just say you want some tanks, uh, the game actually asks you what kind of designer you want these tanks to be made with and you pick whatever and it gets added with the little icon with it on please read up on what they're giving and like if you pick something that is like these two like like this one gives all heavy tank equipment bonuses to all heavy tanks and this gives all heavy tank but this gives production bonus and this gives armor and defense so if you are if you're like a, com a country like germany you really want to armor and defense because you're going to be having the production capacity to make these tanks anyway. So maybe you want the efficiency. So you pick this, but this is going to give you better tanks basically. And these two like soft attack and hard attack. And this is piercing and hard attack. So this is just no brainer. You're going to pick soft attack because piercing is meh and hard attack is also meh for tanks. But soft attack is what you want. So these four are basically the same thing for different things. So this is for the ships, like Reading Fleet and Battle Line Shipbuilders. And this is for the planes. And this is for the uh, the artillery, infantry and uh, automotive. So these are like trucks and mechanized. You can actually have uh, support equipment here too. So uh, these four things basically give bonuses to all kinds of uh, production you're going to have in your country. So the fifth one is industrial concern. You're most countries have three or four of them you can get these but these are really mundane things like electronic research speed is okay industrial research speed is okay like this is good but you usually have more important stuff to spend your 150 political power on industrial concern so i usually don't do this like ever because you always almost always have some place to spend pp on so i would suggest to not waste your pp on things like industrial concern so this is the theorist. Uh, theorist is basically linked to uh, your uh, doctrines. If there's a guy that uh, goes what, for whatever you want in the game, then hire him. And if you don't, just uh, ignore this. It, it's not a re really important slot. So this is the chief of army. These cost political power and also command power. Uh, so for this, I suggest getting the army offense guy and these have levels 
So these are all level two guys for which is expert. Uh, tag Eng. So let's just these are level two and this guy is level three. So this guy is a genius. So so uh, if you have a genius, it's usually a better idea to hire the genius. It's gonna cost more PP, but it's gonna reserve less command power. Uh, but it's gonna give you more bonuses basically. So, uh, but division speed is usually ignored. Uh, it it can be good with tanks, but uh, I usually ignore it because I'm I'm an infantry guy. But uh, it depends on your playstyle. Like if you really want division speed, you can hire this guy. But usually, let's just say when you're playing as Germany, you just want to get either the army organization because it gives division organization, or the army offense guy, which is gonna give division attack. And some of them are really bad, like division training time, 10% is basically nothing to me. But um, division speed is okay, Division the, uh, uh, the division attack is really good, and org is pretty good, I think. But uh, I think the army offense is the best, and then comes army organization and maybe then army defense guy. Uh, Chief of Navy usually ignored, but uh, you can hire whatever you want, basically. Uh, this guy is a genius. This is a better one for convoy raiding, and Germany is known for convoy raiding. So, uh, hiring this guy, Karl Donitz, is actually a good idea. This is like a secondary thing. Like, I would suggest getting chief of army and uh, political advisors, and of course, the laws over this, but uh, eventually, you want to get a chief of air force. Also, these give uh, trickling uh, air XP, and these give uh, naval XP, and these give. Uh, army XP. Military high command, I suggest you focus on getting land uh, related people here, all three spots. So this can give a lot of different things like army logistics, which is uh, minus 8% division attrition, which is like a really good focus, really good bonus. Infantry attack and defense, um, paradrop agility, whatever, like it's, it's negligible basically. But like if you are using tanks, 10% attack and defense. This is like 15% attack and defense. This is great. 8% uh, division recovery rate is really great. And there are some like really bad ones like close air support, attack, defense, agility. It's fine, I guess, but it's like negligible. So I suggest you get things like division attrition, uh, division recovery rate, uh, division attack and defense, or maybe if you are using tanks. Armor Division Attack and Defense. I usually reserve these all three spots for uh, land related things like infantry attack, infantry defense, recovery speed, uh, division attrition, whatever, things like that. So this is the decisions tab. Uh, some countries have different things in the de decisions tab. So let's, let's, for example, United States has the whole thing about Congress and Senate support and House support. For example, Bulgaria has something else, so they have faction management. Usually you have things like uh, about propaganda efforts, this gives uh, war support to your country. And you have political actions, which are related to the factions in your country, like the, the, the democracy and non-land and the other two ideologies. And improved worker conditions, like this gives um, weekly stability, but uh, gives you a factory output for the duration of this. So. Uh, these are actually like semi-important for your country. It depends on the country, of course. And you also get things like um, formable nations under this. So if we like tag Sweden, we are gonna get the Kalmar Union and the Nordic Unity. What you usually do from the decisions is uh, propaganda efforts because uh, getting high war support at war is very important and also improved worker conditions because most countries uh, actually have a problem with stability so this gives weekly stability for your country uh, so th this, these are kind of important and also the the anti whatever raids and also the banning some of them uh, could be important for your country if there is a problem with that ideology in your country so the second one is uh, the intelligence agency you can form an agency here so when the intelligence agency is formed you have country intelligence as zero, which is used to defend your country against uh, other uh, nations who are using intelligence agency. Uh, you also have uh, upgrades to your spies. You can get uh, civilian intelligence, army, naval and air force. 
So there's a level of intelligence you have from other nations. And you can see this when you right click on the nation and you go to Intel Ledger. So I, when I hover over this, it says total civilian intel 25%, which is given by uh, limited exports 10% and their ideology gives 15%. And I, if I right click on United Kingdom, it gives 40% because they are on expert focus and democratic, which gives 20%. And at the bottom, you can actually see what kind of bonuses, like things that you can see at certain breakpoints in your intelligence level, like at 50%. We can see building counts and history on map resource routes from colonies, complete the national focuses, research civilian tech count. So when I check the national focuses from uh, United Kingdom, I can't see anything like which focuses they have done, which focus they are doing, which, which is unknown focus right now. But if I put some, um, some spies in uh, United Kingdom, then this will go up and I will start seeing more information about their country so that then I can prepare, if I want to invade them, I can prepare my invasion according to what they are doing. So this could be actually very beneficial. The same goes for Army Intel, Navy Intel, and uh, Air Force. So the more information you have about them, the more things you can see uh, about that nation. And as you can see, we have we can see the approximate count of your factories, manpower, oil, whatever. So this is actually very useful if you want to invade a country to see what they're doing. Like, let's just say you are fighting Germany and you're wondering if they're going to run out of manpower yet. And you can see that they have 1 to 1.82 million manpower available. So you will need to fight on uh, until they're out of manpower. And you can see there conscription law and the other laws of course so this is actually like a very informative if you are fighting a war so that uh, you know uh, if you are winning or losing in the long term basically because in the short term you can actually see from the map but in the long term you can see from here especially if you are fighting a war that is about uh, attrition not about uh, conquering land which happens sometimes especially in the late game so uh, the defense, the passive defense gives you counterintelligence, which is which helps you catch the spies of other nations that are in your country. And anti-partisan, you can use your spies to quell rebellions, like three or four um, uh, pieces of land that you, you have conquered. Uh, operations, this is usually not that important. Uh, but if you are using spies extensively, you can check what these do. Um, I'm sure there are a lot of videos about uh, using spies efficiently, but what we usually use spies for is to get 50% uh, intel network and then use them to get uh, collaborations in other countries. Because if you have 100% collaboration in the country, you actually get, like, when you click the war and you hover over the country it says it controls 100% of its victory points and will capitulate when it has 20% or less so you need to conquer 80% of their victory points which could be difficult but if you have a collaboration government in their country then that 20% limit actually goes up let's just say it goes up to 40% then you need to just conquer 60% of their victory points and they will capitulate and not only that, after you conquer their lands and you annex them, uh, the compliance bonus you get is actually what your uh, what kind of collaboration you did in, in that uh, country. So if you had, if you had 100% compliance and you conquer their lands, you will actually have 100% compliance strength on that land, and you will most likely never get a resistance from that country. So it's very beneficial, but. Uh, it's a bit time-consuming to do collaborations. So I suggest using collaborations and you can actually use them with non-aligned and uh, brown I, I think also red ideology. Let's just Let's just uh, check. Yeah, so the uh, non-aligned can do them and uh, And reds can do them also, but uh, if you tag England they can't do that. They have the exile government thing, which is a completely different thing. So uh, you 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 should 
probably do collaboration governments against nations that are actually huge and takes a long time to conquer. Like Germany is one of them, Soviet Union is one of them, China is one of them, and the United States is one of them. I suggest, especially for United States, if you use collaboration governments, you will see that uh, you will actually capitulate them far easier than uh, otherwise. So spies are, spies are usually used for that. Uh, research is basically... So the first one is the infantry. So weapons and equipment, you should be doing all of this. And the big ones give the new guns and you should be making new guns immediately when you research them. So this is always do all of these with all nations. So this is mobile infantry, which is like uh, the uh, trucks and the, the mechanized. If you are using tanks, do these. You don't have to do the Amtraks or the armored cars. Uh, the, these are usually not used in the game, so just ignore them. And do these five if you're gonna use tanks and just use these two if you don't want to use tanks because you're gonna use trucks. And for special forces, these are the marines and the paratroopers and the mountaineers. Uh, these are like used in many niche cases, but uh, if you're a new player, just don't bother with these. Support companies, I suggest using engineers, recon, military police, and also logistics. With armor, you have the, the medium tanks, the light tanks, the amphibious tanks, and the heavy tanks, and the super heavy tanks. If you're gonna use tanks, you're most likely going to use medium tanks, so research those. No one really uses amphibious tanks, no one really uses light tanks. Uh, heavy tanks are used in multiplayer, as I'm told, and super heavy tanks, which no one really uses. And motor tanks, I'm told, that are worse than 1943 medium tanks. So just stick with 1943 mediums. And the left side, you can research the armors and also the engine upgrades for the tanks. Artillery. So the middle part is just uh, basic regular artillery. The left side is anti-air, the right side is anti-tank, and this side is rocket artillery. In most games, you want to research artillery and maybe also anti-air. Don't bother with anti-tank unless you want to use the anti-tank guns on your uh, close air supports. Then I suggest going up to uh, the second art the second anti-tank. You can use also rocket artillery in your divisions, but I usually don't bother with this. With naval, you don't really need to know anything about this. If you really want to make ships, make submarines, and put snorkels on them, that's about it. You don't need to know anything else. And with naval support, you only need to know these three, which are bonuses to uh, torpedoes. You don't need to do anything else. And you need to research this, this, and this. Because these give you the option to navally invade other nations. And you, you need at least the first one to navally invade other countries. And the second one, the third one, gives you bonuses to naval invasions, basically. So with the air, if you are going to use what I'm using, which are small fighters and small casts, you need to research the left side until 1944. This and this, which is heavy bombs. You need survivability studies. You need heavy MG and you need to get level 1 cannons and you can ignore this, you can ignore this you need this, this and all the engines and also the range improvements and with engineering you need electronics from this side and the radar from this side you need, you can ignore the middle ones and you can basically ignore all of this and industry is the most important one so with production you're gonna move all the way up to here and to streamlined line. Uh, with industry, you can pick concentrated or dispersed. And of course, we're gonna move up the construction all the way. And these give resource gain efficiency, just do them after you have done all the important stuff. And with synthetic oil, you can just ignore this basically. So, uh, when it comes to priorities in my games, what do I do? The first priority is electronics. And the second one is production industry and construction all three of them are extremely important because this helps you produce stuff and this helps you research more stuff because it gives research speed and after those infantry techs are really important artillery techs are really important and 
if you're gonna use supports like engineer then that's really important and after that you need to have this at least and then you can start researching the small airframes the bombs for the CAS uh, the survivability studies the guns for the fighters uh, aircraft construction range improvements and engines uh, international market is a new thing you can buy and sell equipment so what I suggest is if you really 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 want something you can buy them and if you really 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 don't need something you can sell them uh, other than that I don't suggest using this this is just a big waste of time I think but if you have tanks let's just say you're playing as Germany and you got some tanks and you don't plan on using tanks just switch those um, divisions into infantry and sell all of your tanks in the market trade is very important so what this says is basically the resources that you have in your country and extract it is what actually comes out of your what what comes out of the ground and imported is what you are importing from other countries exported is what you have on your trade law so we have export focus which is resource to market is 50 percent so we take 100 oil from the ground and we are exporting 50 of them. That means we are not selling 50 of them. We are offering up to 50 oil to other countries. Whether they buy them or not is dependent on them. We must put this amount of oil based on our uh, trade law on the market. And we don't actually, we don't use that. That's gone from our country. And if the other nations decide to buy uh, our resources then we get civilian factories in return if they don't we get nothing so that's why we need to move up to limited exports or maybe close the economy when we are at war with a lot of nations and we are not selling our resources so what i do with construction let me just go over the things and then i'll just tell you what i do so infrastructure what does it give it gives you basically what it gives you is the uh, it helps you build other things on that piece of land faster. So if you want to build a lot of factories on a piece of land, let's just say you're going to build seven civilian factories and maybe more after you research the more things in the uh, construction and industry because these give actually uh, max factories in a state. So if you research these, you're going to have more, more slots to build and uh, you're gonna have more factories to build in these lands so if you want to build like seven facility factories it's better to build infrastructure first and then civil factories because if you hover over this it tells you the speed so construction speed is 67.2 that's because output from eight factories like we are using eight factories for this let's just remove this so that it's 15. so what it's uh, what it says is factory output is five Construction speed is 126 because we are using 15 factories, which is 75 power. And construction speed modified by limited exports, 5%, which is this, our trade law. And we can get 0.6 modifier on it because of state infrastructure. Because that land has three infrastructure, which is 60%. So it's going to have 0.6. So if we had 100% infrastructure first, then it would be uh, times two. So uh, let me just, just explain the speed. So with one factory on a land that has 60%, it's gonna be built in, it's gonna be built with uh, 126 construction speed. But if, let's just say we're gonna build an 80% uh, place, it's going to be built in 141 so the more things that are that are going to be built in a place it's better to have a maximum infrastructure before you build any of the things in that piece of land so infrastructure is important in that case this also ju not just for uh, factories this goes for everything that's going to be built on that land let's just say you're going to build a naval base and when you hover over this then it's going to say state infrastructure again, like all kinds of uh, building is dependent on the level of infrastructure in that uh, state. 
So infrastructure is important if you want to build more stuff on that state. Airbase is basically to put airport, uh, the airplanes in. Uh, if you have maxed out uh, airports, then you can have 2000 planes. And if you have zero, then there, there isn't an airport to put uh, planes in. Anti-air is if you are getting strategically bombed, I don't suggest using these at all. Uh, radar is important to uh, see the air and the naval movement around your country. The more radar you have, the more that you're going to see what's going to happen. Like, you're going to get positive modifiers to your ships and your planes, basically, if you have more radar. And the more radar you have, the better bonuses you get. So, if I build if I build a lot of radars on the uh, border of Poland, I start seeing how many uh, divisions they have. And if I build more and more radars, I'm going to start seeing further into their lands and where their divisions are. So, radar is actually really good. Civilian the military factory is basically just what you what you need to produ uh, produce stuff. And civilian factory is more power to build other things. So, when to build military factories and when to build civilian factories? Basically, what I do is, I ask myself this question. Will I start a war in two years? Will I be at war in two years? If the answer is yes, then build military factories. If the answer is no, then build civilian factories. That's it. Dockyards, I almost never make these. Synthetic refinery, I almost never make these. Fuel silo, I don't even know what they do. It's it's unimportant. Rocket site, ignore. Nuclear reactor, if you want to play a really long game, like 1945 to 1950 or something, then you can build nuclear, nuclear reactors and use them for nukes. But other than that, ignore them. Uh, conversion is uh, basically ignored as well. Uh, supply hub is actually important. So let's just say... You are Poland and you're gonna conquer the Soviet Union. But if you have troops in this place, they're gonna run out of supply. So if you build a supply hub, then they're not gonna be out of supply. Of course, you need to link them with railways as well, but you get the point. So for supply reasons, it's very important to build supply hubs naval bases, because they are also supply hubs basically, as you can see. Uh, supply hubs, naval bases, and link them up with railways, and try to have, let's just say you're gonna build a supply hub here, then you're gonna need a good railway, and this is basically the weakest link, so if you have level 5 everywhere, except this place, it's gonna get bottlenecked here. So you need to have level 5 all the way, or maybe like level 3 all the way, instead of level 5 everywhere except for one place. So yeah, I almost always build up my railways when I'm conquering a country. Especially if it's a country like Soviet Union, because it's huge, and you need a lot of supply. So these are actually really important. Uh, land fort I almost never use. Coastal fort I have never used this. So you can just ignore these. For production, so we have a lot of production in this game, but uh, it's actually very straightforward. Like, this makes the basic stuff. Guns, you need a lot of guns. You usually don't have a lot of guns until it's 1939 or something, so make sure you are building a lot of guns. And so you can actually capture guns from other nations, but when you are building them, you are building the good stuff. And it matters, so... Uh, make sure you are building guns. Uh, trains are important. You can check the train situation from here. Logistics fulfillment. It says trains needed 5 and stockpiles 19. You need to have a good stockpile of trains, trucks and convoys. You don't really need to make them if you have fought a war and won the war. Because AI usually makes a lot of trains and you can just capture them. So, Support equipment is important. If you, if you are using support equipment in your uh, divisions, just make them. Truck is very important for supply reasons. You can just click this two times and you're using trucks. And if you are using the horses, you're not using trucks. And I suggest using trucks. So make trucks, use them. It's good. So this is an improved airframe. So you're going to be putting uh, heavy machine guns. Level 3 engine, just one of them. 
you're gonna have uh, self-sealing fueling tanks because this gives the most amount of uh, defense and you're gonna have uh, armor plates so this is 23 and maybe you're gonna have um, extra fuel tanks for range and when you try to save it Yeah, basically this is what I would use in 1940 scenario. So we're gonna have 19 air defense, 54 air attack, and we have full weight and thrust, and we have great range. So this is a good fighter, you can use this. And for CAS, again, the best engine, but just a simple engine. With CAS weapons, you're gonna, you're gonna get heavy bomb locks. You put as many of them as possible, and just dive breaks. That's it. This gives, when you're doing close air, if you hover over it, it's gonna show you. So we have full weight, again, equal to thrust. We have 15 air defense, and we have 24 ground attack. So that's the cast that I would use in my, in my games. So if you want to make ships, you're gonna use Submarine Hall 3. You're gonna put Torpedo 3. You're gonna put a Schnorkel and another torpedo and another torpedo and the best engine and that's gonna be the submarine that you're gonna use that's it uh, recruit and deployment so what i do is put upgrades on low priority and garrisons on high priority and i don't switch anything else and you can see your division templates from here so what is a good division template let me just explain there are two kinds of players the ones who are like me, who use infantry for everything. And there are players who use tanks to attack and infantry to defend. So if you are a player like me, you're going to be making a division like this. This is basically it. So what it does, you have nine infantry. You have 4 artillery, you have engineer support, artillery support, and recon support. So this is this has a lot of HP, this has a lot of organization, this has a substantial amount of soft attack, almost no hard attack, this has a lot of defense, okay amount of breakthrough, and this can be used on almost every single battlefield on the game. You can just make these everywhere. You can attack from attack with them, you can defend with them, you can do everything with them. You don't need any kind of other divisions. You can just have this division everywhere and you can win the war. Also, you can be a tank player, which requires a template like this. Let's just say pure infantry and you have artillery support and engineer support. So this division doesn't have a lot of breakthrough or soft attack. But it has a lot of HP and it has a lot of defense. So you're going to be using this for defense only. You never attack with this. We have the improved medium tank chassis. We are going to be putting the medium turret type with three man turret. Because this gives the breakthrough that we need. Cannon or medium howitzer. So basically cannon gives same amount of soft attack and hard attack basically. But Hobbitzer gives a lot more soft attack with almost no hard attack. And we want the Hobbitzer because we rarely fight tanks in a single player situation. And for the specials, you can pick whatever you want. So this gives a lot of um, breakthrough and soft attack. Let's just pick small cannon. This gives just soft attack, but this gives, break uh, this gives breakthrough also. So let's just pick this one. From the specials, you can pick armor skirt. This gives breakthrough and armor, and sloped armor, which gives percentage armor. As you can see, this gives a lot more bonus to defense and breakthrough. And you can pump the engine and armor from here. So let's just say that's it. This could be a good tank, I think. You can pick the design, whatever. So, what this has is a lot of soft attack, a lot of armor, a lot of breakthrough, and it has 8 speed. 
So a division like this has a lot of breakthrough, a lot of soft attack. It has okay HP. It has good organization. You need to you need to have at least 30 organization in every division uh, because people want to use more tanks and less uh, infantry for their divisions and it just gets worse and worse for HP and organization when you remove a lot of infantry. Uh, so with, with, we have a lot of soft attack and breakthrough which is gonna help us win the war basically and armor is of course the best thing to have with tanks. So this would be a pretty good uh, medium tank des uh, design and if you remove infantry and uh, put more tanks it's gonna get better and better and better but the cost is gonna go high up and up and up. So. Just uh, make it a good divi division, make it combat with 30, because 30 is the best right now. Uh, and if you want, you can add more supports, like uh, logistics, because it helps with the su uh, supply. So yeah, you would have these to attack, and these to defend, and maybe also add uh, anti-air. This is a good garrison. And later on, uh, when you research MPs, you can actually put MPs in them. This makes them better. So the logistics tab. This is actually a very important tab that most people don't use. So what this does is, it gives you uh, like a summary of what you're doing. So it, sh it says like medium tanks. You have minus 350 medium tanks. What does this mean? That means you have divisions on the field that need 350 medium tanks to perform properly. Same goes for infantry, same goes for anti-air. And your job to produce enough to keep all of this number green. As long as these are green, then you are happy. And if they are red, then you are underperforming. Let's say like you can, uh, you can hover over this, the brown part. It says uh, current manpower, 88%. So this this needs manpower to come and uh, join the group. And also it says waiting for equipment to be produced and delivered. 100 infantry equipment and 20 towed anti-air. So this this division has 81% combat fighting strength, like current fighting strength. So uh, when you look at your division. Like when you when you look at your army and you look at the divisions, the green one is organization and it goes up to whatever maximum organization that division has, and the brown one is the fighting strength. You need this to be as high as possible, up to 100%. If it's at 100%, then the stats you're gonna see on the division is the actual stats it's gonna use in a combat situation. When you're not sure like why the brown bars are not moving upwards to 100%. Just check your logistics, especially if you have annexed some country and now let's say let's let's say we have annexed Poland. Now we're gonna have a huge deficit on, on guns. Why? Because we are actually occupying Poland and we need garrisons. We need 14 divisions to uh, cover the land and we're gonna need more if the resistance goes up. And you can actually see how high the resistance is going to be from this list. So it's going to be about like 10%. Uh, here it's going to be about 17%, whatever. So as the compliance goes up, the resistance is going to go lower. But at this stage, with military governor, uh, you're going to have a resistance, a little bit of resistance on Poland. And you're going to need garrisons to actually keep the people from rebelling. So we need a lot more... Uh, infantry equipment and also support equipment to uh, man the garrisons to hold the land. So the more land you capture, the more garrisons you're gonna ha need. And garrisons also use manpower too, so you're gonna lose a little bit of manpower from there. That's why Prince of Terror is actually great for conquering nations, because when you get this guy, you're gonna get manpower from the land and you're gonna get less damage to your garrisons. So that's why logistics is important. Just regularly check this list, see what you have on, like if you have like 100,000 
uh, infantry equipment just laying around, you can actually uh, just cut the amount of guns you're making and make something else. So it's important to keep the tabs on this logistics tab. And finally, we have officer corps uh, or corps. <laughs> So what we have is the three guys that we have recruited and also the terrorists. These are the same three here and this. Uh, you can also hire them from this list. This uh, shows you the country preferred tactic. These, this is the tactic that your country prefers to use in a combat situation. With the spirit of the academy, I almost, use, I almost always use bold attack because it's going to give you a higher chance to get attack. And with the spirit of the army, I almost always use professional officer core because it gives 5% army XP, uh, daily command power gain bonus, and also 5% discount to all land doctrines, which is the, which is a great thing. With navy, I don't really bother with it. With air force, there are two things to be picked from here. So with the spirit of the air force, I almost always use air crew surveys to get minus 25 to air accident chance. And from the Spirit of Air, Co Air Force Command, I pick Centralized Control, which gives air mission efficiency 10%. So this is our political power. Whenever you want to do something about like diplomacy or spies or whatever, you need to have political power. You use political power for the laws and government and whatever. You also use them to, let's say you have a puppet and you want to reduce their... Um, autonomy and annex them and you're gonna use political power for that so basically you use your political power for basically everything that is not combat related so that's important stability is also very important if you're at war and stability is below 50 percent if your stability is high enough you're gonna get bonuses like political power gain factory output like your dockyard output whatever so uh, try to keep stability as like as close to 100 as possible. War support should be close to 100. What usually lowers war support is if you are losing a lot of men, if you are getting your bomber, uh, country bombed, if you are letting your convoy sunk, then your war support is gonna suffer. Use your uh, decisions to keep your stability and war support as high as possible. Manpower is very important. If you reach zero manpower, you're gonna lose the war. So try to keep it above zero. Factories is very uh, straightforward. The more that you have, the better. Fuel should not be zero. Uh, logistics should be 100%. You can just hover over it and it's going to tell you what kind of things that you need to get it to 100%. Convoys should be at uh, a non-zero number. If you have zero convoys, you're in trouble. So try to produce convoys to keep it uh, above zero. Command power is used to... Uh, give orders to armies like if you want to say last stand or like whatever like force attack you're gonna use command power but usually what people use command power for is when you click show field uh, commanders and you want to promote someone to become a general then you're gonna use a uh, command power so this one would use 100 command power so you're gonna use command power for that most most of the time and when you put someone on military high command or chief of army or whatever, it's gonna reserve command power. Or when you go to strategic air mode and you want to give some bonuses to your planes, let's say I want to give them more grand crews, it's gonna reserve 20 command power. So that's another way to use command power. Uh, army XP is used on uh, division templates. If you're adding something to your division template, it's gonna cost you army XP. Uh, same goes with uh, supports as well <clears throat> and also if you're advancing your doctrines it's gonna cost you army xp that's the main usage of the army xp and the way you get army xp is of course fighting in a war or you can uh, let's just say you can send uh, volunteers to fight in another war that you're not in or you can send an attache and if they are fighting they're gonna give 15% uh, of their army XP so that you get uh, army XP from that also naval XP and air XP uh, you can also uh, exercise your divisions to get a little bit of army XP same goes for navy if you are fighting naval wars you're gonna get navy XP you can get navy XP from um, training your navies 
Same goes for ARX3 and the usages are the same. If you have any questions about the game, ask me, I'll try to answer them in the comments. So thank you for watching, I'll see you on the next video, goodbye.